why many Christians will end up following the Antichrist. And, and actually, this is uh, a, a question that stemmed. I was scrolling on uh, Facebook uh, about a month or two ago. And I saw this, um, you know how they have these memes, and uh, cartoon character, these memes, and, and, and they ask a question or they say something and it kind of gets you thinking. Uh, so there was a question of this, of this uh, individual asked a pastor in this meme. I'm not going to tell you what it is because then I'm going to go ahead of the study. I'll tell you when we reach the point of the study. Uh, but it got me thinking, and it was about the Antichrist, and it was about what modern Christianity is preaching about the Antichrist. And, and it was around the same time that I was preparing studies, for those of you who, who follow me on YouTube, I was preparing studies talking about the Antichrist, and I was dealing with um, Daniel chapter 7, and we see um, in, in the study that there's 11 identification marks that Daniel goes to identify the Antichrist, and then John takes those identification marks a step further in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, uh, pinpointing what we know to be the papacy, uh, the beast power. But then I, I, started, I started wondering, I'm like, well, okay, we know that from the Bible and according to history, but still, when, if Satan were to come to you and tell you a bold-faced lie just out of nowhere, you would not fall for it. The only reason why we do fall for it is because Satan, like in the Garden of Eden, he mixed the error with truth, and he presented the truth in such a beautiful way that it bypassed Eve's mind of the error. And Eve was like, okay, yeah, this sounds great. So the same thing with us. If Satan is going to deceive us, he is going to try to do it in a very slick manner. He can't just come to us up front. So then I started wondering, well, then why will many Christians follow the Antichrist when the Antichrist reveals himself? Because, why? Satan's not going to come to us with a bold-faced lie. He's going to try to distort truth in the Bible, in the doctrine, and this is why we see this false sugar-coated gospel going around Christianity today. Open our Bible, let's open our Bibles to 1 John. Come with me here to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, and let's read verse 18. First John 2, verse 18. John says, now, now this is John talking, and he is writing this according to according to church tradition. He writes the book of first, second, and third John after the book of Revelation. And he says in 1 John 2, verse 18. He says, Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So John is saying, hey, there's many Antichrists, but he says there is going to be a Antichrist to come. That Antichrist shall come. It's to John's future, but when we study in history, it's our history our history but to John's future because the papacy that beast power has not yet been formed yet when John is writing this but it will come and John says that Antichrist will come so then have you ever looked up in the Greek the word Antichrist what does it mean Antichrist means simply an opponent of the Messiah or an opponent of Christ and if you look at the word anti specifically the word anti means opposite of Christ. So John says that there is an antichrist to come. And if you look up the word antichrist, antichrist just simply means an opponent of Christ. And anti, specifically, that word anti means opposite of Christ. So let me ask you a question. If John says that antichrist shall come, then what do we got to look for? We gotta look for someone that's a power that's opposite of Christ, that's an opponent of Christ. So now we have to look at the character of Christ. What is Christ? What did he what was his mission that he came down on the earth to do? And based on what based on the mission that Christ did, 
then we can see who is opposite of Christ, and then we can identify this Antichrist that John says is to come. So let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. This was our scripture reading, Matthew 1, 21. This is one of my favorite texts in the Bible. Very easy to memorize but is one that the devil has tried to just twitch. Matthew 1, 21, and it simply says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for it is he that shall save his people from what? Their sins. From their sins. So is Jesus going to save us in our sins, or is he going to save us from our from, sins? From. from our sins. What's the what's the uh, popular message in modern Christianity? God's now, love. God is love. That God loves everybody. No one's going to be condemned. We don't. You know, we are going to be sinning till Jesus comes. It's not just in the evangelical world. It's also in God's remnant church. You find this theory. We're going to be sinning until Jesus comes. So don't worry about trying to keep God's law. Or don't worry about uh, 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 of repenting from sin. God did all that at the cross. He did it all at the cross. He paid it all. You don't have to do nothing because you are under grace. But here, the Bible says, Jesus came to save us from our sins. Now, another point I started thinking was that a lot of churches like to use the word sin. Sin, sin, yeah, God hates sin, God hates sin, but they never go to the definition of what sin is. What is sin? You're the preacher, amen, he's telling me that we should not do sin. Christ, God, hates sin, but what is sin? Jesus came to save his people from sin because the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus takes the penalty of sin for us if we believe. That word believe in the Greek is very interesting. It means to entrust your spiritual well-being to God. So we only get forgiveness and repentance from, from sin if we entrust our spiritual well-being to God. What does that mean? The Bible says that we are the sheep and Jesus is the shepherd. And Jesus says, these are my people, um, Revelation, Revelation 7, Revelation 7, Revelation 4, I want to say Revelation 7, where it talks about uh, the, the 144,000, the, the saints of God who are going to be saved. It says, these follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. They follow Christ. He is the shepherd and they are the sheep. And they willingly entrust their spiritual well-being to God. They believe, they repent, and they confess of their sins, and they turn away from their sinful deeds. That's where 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus' mission, according to Matthew 1, 1, came to save us from sin. So the Antichrist, which is anti-God, which is an opponent of Christ, which is opposite of Christ, if Jesus came to save us from sin, that means the Antichrist has to promote sin or lead us into sin. Let's go to let's go to 1 John. Back to 1 John. You might want to put a marker there. Back to 1 John, because now we have to identify what sin is. We like to throw the word sin around. And we, we it, it sounds a little like a bouncing ball. The preacher is like, God wants you to turn away from sin. God wants you to repent from your sins. But we don't know what sin is. What is the biblical definition of sin? 1 John 3, 4. Another very easy scripture to memorize. Simply says, 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Now, some versions are going to say, uh, they're, they're going to change it a little bit, and they're going to say that sin is lawlessness, which is not, is not an incorrect translation. It's true. But I like this a little more specifically because it identifies, uh, 1 John 3, 4, because it identifies more, more specifically when you break the law, you have sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. So wait a minute. Is there a law that Christians have to keep. 
now is very interesting because in modern Christianity we say that the law was done away with. That was nailed to the cross. In fact, that is old covenant stuff. That's, that's Old Testament. We New Testament Christians. We are the New Covenant. We don't need to keep none of that stuff. The law was nailed to the cross. So if there is no law, then how are you going to know what sin is? Because the definition of sin is transgression or breaking the law. Now what law? We need to get specific because we understand that in, in Israel there was two types of laws. And it is true there was one that was nailed to the cross, but there was another one that wasn't. Now modern Christianity likes to link those two together and say, ah, they were all done away with. But we got to get specific here. Let's go to James. Let's go to the book of James. Jump with me to the book of James. Sin is transgression of the law. We have to now identify what law is that. James chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. You can, if you, I, I like to write little notes in my Bible right next to the verses, and I link all these things together. It's very, very fabulous how, how many verses are, are connected to just 1 John 3, 4. James chapter 2, verse 10 through 12 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not kill. Let me ask you something. What law is that talking about? There's only one law that says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. This is talking about the Ten Commandments. It says, Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So let me ask you something. The Ten Commandments, it says that this is the law that we are going to be judged by. This is God's standard. You break this law, it says that you have now become a transgressor of the law. That's the same thing we read in 1 John 3, 4. So what law is 1 John 3, 4 talking about that identifies what sin is? Sin is breaking God's law, specifically his Ten Commandments. It's the law of liberty. Why is it called the law of liberty? It frees you from sin. Imagine if the whole world kept just one commandment. Hmm. Just one. Specifically, let's just go, thou shalt not kill, since it's the end of the Bible. No war, no crime. It will make the police officer's job a lot more easier. You would be at liberty, because in certain places, once it hits dark, you dare not go walk outside. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. You're almost guaranteed to, you want something bad to happen to you. So now, guess what? If everybody kept, thou shalt not kill, you're at liberty. To even walk at night in the most what was what would be the most dangerous part of town, guess what? You're safe. All because we keep one commandment. Yeah. So imagine now if we keep more commandments. Thou shalt not lie. You know how many bad things have happened just because of a lie? The devil. He sorry to be. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Honor thy father and the mother. That's why it's called the law of liberty, because it grants us freedom. Now the popular opponents of, of, of this would say, well, it's not only is it old covenant, not only is it done away with, but it's, uh, it's bondage. It's a law of bondage. But is it a law of bondage? It's not. It's there to promote our freedom. As a matter of fact, there was, as I said earlier, there was two laws in Israel. There was the Ten Commandments, and then you had the Mosaic, the ceremonial law. One law was nailed to the cross. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people in modern Christianity, they like to say that it's this law that was nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep it because Christ did it all for us. So, what's the root of that problem? What many don't realize is that there was two laws in Israel. There was the Ten Commandments, and because they rebelled, you can read that in Deuteronomy, I believe it's Deuteronomy 34, Moses says, I am going to write this book of the law, or the law of Moses, because of your rebellion. And I'm going to put it next to, not inside, I'm going to put it next to the Ark of the Covenant for a testimony, for a witness against thee. Guess what? A couple thousand years later, here comes Paul. And Paul writes in Colossians 2, most famous Colossians 2, 14. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us and contrary to us, nailing it to his cross. 
talking about there was a law that was done away with. I agree with that, but it was in the Ten Commandments. Because that's the standard of God. That's the law of God that points and identifies to us what is sin. So it had to be a law that contained ordinances. Do we find any ordinances in the Ten Commandments? Do we find anything talking about the sacrificial system? Rituals or religious rites? Feast days? Do we find any of that in the Ten Commandments? No. So how do we know that it's talking about the Mosaic Law? Because it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. And there's multiple places in the Old Testament where it calls the Law of Moses the Law of Ordinances. The Passover was an ordinance they had to do. All the religious rites, the religious rituals, the, the sacrificial system, which all uh, Hebrew says were a shadow of things to come. What well, good things to come? It pointed to Christ. And Christ came and fulfilled all those things. That's why he nailed it to his cross. As a matter of fact, when you keep on reading Colossians chapter 2, I believe it's verse 15 or 16, it says, let no man judge you in a meat offering or drink offering. So right there you know there is no meat offering, there is no drink offering found in the Ten Commandments. But this is the key. It says, let no man judge you in meat or drink or Sabbath days. So right there. You got the Ten Commandments done away with because the Ten Commandments is the law that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And now, Paul says that these Sabbath days were nailed to the cross. It was done away with. But what many don't realize is that there was two types of Sabbaths. There was two types of Sabbath in the Hebrew religion. There was one Seventh day Sabbath according to the commandments of God, which when you read the commandments of God, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. For the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Takes you back to creation. So when you go to creation, you should find a similar wording. And you do. In Genesis 2, 1 through 3. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work, which he had created and made. And he blessed the Sabbath day on the seventh day. And he sanctified it. Meaning that he set it apart for a holy purpose. He made that day holy. You ain't going to find no other day that God created that he blessed it or made it holy. Only the seventh day. So, then you fast forward to Hebrews chapter 4. I believe it's Hebrews 4 verse 4. And this is New Testament. Now, Paul says, for he spake, God spake in the seventh day of this wise. And he, and, and he quotes Genesis. And God did rest on the seventh day from all his works which God created and made. There's the Sabbath in the book of Hebrews. I thought we were New Testament Christians. Well, yeah. The Apostle Paul, he quotes the Sabbath established in Genesis. Let me ask you something. If the Sabbath was just for the Jews, if the law of God was just for the Jews, was there a Jew in the Garden of Eden? There was no such thing as a Jew. The Jews didn't come until 1,500, maybe 2,000 years later. It was just Adam and Eve and their descendants. That's why Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath was not made for just one group of people. It was made for all of mankind to experience rest in Christ. But here, in modern Christianity, it's taught that this law was done away with, that it was nailed to the cross. If it was done away with, then why does Revelation 22:14 say Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to enter into the gates of the heavenly city. And then in verse 15, it starts saying, for those that are outside of the heavenly city, meaning you didn't make it to heaven. Why? Because you rejected the gospel of Christ, which was to save you from sin, which means you decided to, to stay in sin. You decided to continue to break God's law and transgress God's law. It says those that are outside of the heavenly city are... Adulterers, idolaters, thieves, covetous, uh, those who loveth and maketh a lie, all those things are what the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not do. So now let's go to, come with me to Romans. Come with me to Romans. This is a scripture, one of my favorite texts of scripture talking about this, this subject, because this is what many Christians in, the, in modern Christianity they overlook this. Romans chapter 7. And we're going to read Romans 7, and we're going to read verse 7, and then we're going to read verse 12. Romans
Romans 7, verse 7, and then we're going to read verse 12. Romans 7, verse 7 says, Paul's saying, he says, What then is the law sin? God forbid. In fact, uh, he says somewhere else, Are we under grace? Because shall we continue to sin because we're under grace? He also says, God forbid. That's what's being taught in modern Christianity. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Jude calls that turning the grace of God into, I cannot pronounce this word, right, but turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Long word. But you know what I'm talking about. Which means giving the green light. I'm a Christian, but I live life opposite of what the word of God tells me to. But guess what? I still go to church. I still give my tithe and offering. God loves me how I am. I don't need to change. I'm still a Christian. And I can live life however I want. I can go to the club, like you mentioned in Sabbath school. I can go to the club. Or I can go hang out doing this or do that. And guess what? All I got to do is just come to church and just confession. And I got, I'm covered. That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. I said it right Paul says, shall, what then? Shall, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul is saying, wait a minute, the law is important, because the law of God is telling us what sin is. The law of God says, thou shalt not covet, so now I know that if I covet something that's not mine, that's sin. So, in the modern Christianity world, like I said earlier, preachers just like to throw the word sin around in the church, but they don't go and identify the definition of what sin is in the Bible. So how are we going to know what is sin if you're telling me that the thing that identifies what sin is is done away with? You might as well say there's no sin either. That's why Paul says in verse 12, jump to verse 12. He says, wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy, just, and good. So Paul here gives us the definition of what is sin and why is it important to keep God's commandments. It's not a righteousness by works. It's a righteousness by faith. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's John 14, 15. We keep God's commandments. We keep God's law because we love God. We cannot keep it of our own selves, but we do it with the power and strength of Christ. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4, 13. Noah. Noah is a perfect example. Because God gave Noah a command, which was build an ark. Why? Because it's going to rain, and I'm going to destroy the world. Noah never saw rain. Noah never even never could fathom the possibility of the world being destroyed, much less by a worldwide flood. I'm sure there was fires around, and maybe fires destroyed a couple of forests, but ne never rain. If God would have said, hey, I'm going to destroy the earth through fire, that may have been a little more believable, but rain? I've never seen rain before, much less clouds. But he took God's word as truth, and he obeyed, not knowing he... Uh, Hebrew says he, he uh, by faith, Noah obeyed God of things not seen. Never seen rain before, but he took God's word at his command, and the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. What's being taught is that you don't need to keep God's commandments because you're under grace. But let me ask you something. How could, you be, how could there be grace if there is no law? Yes, you don't need it. If there's no law, then there's no need of grace. Yes. Yet what's being preached in modern Christianity is that we're under grace, we're not under the law. But what does Paul say? I believe it's Romans 3. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we're under grace? God forbid. Grace is the power of God that God gives us forgiveness of sins and the power of God to help us turn away from sin. I'm going to give you a very simple example of what grace, grace, the law, and sin, they're all related. They all need each other. If there is no sin, then there is no need of a law, there is no need of grace. You're, you've probably heard this example before, but it's the very easiest, simplest concept. If you are driving in the highway, 
you got a what we call speed limit. The speed limit is the law of the highway. Speed limit is 40. You're doing 60. What are you doing? You're breaking the law. According to the Bible, you transgress the law of the the law of God, or the law of the highway in the earthly standards. So now you have the policeman. The policeman sees that you're doing 60 on a 40. Does he have right to go after you? Yes. Yes, he does. He pulls you over, and he could either do two things. Because you broke the law, he could either condemn you under the law, which means you're going to get a ticket, or he can say, after you give him the reason for it, he can have the power to give you a warning. Biblical terms, mercy, grace. But if there was no speed limit, let's say there was no speed limit in the highway, there's no law saying how fast or how slow you could go. You can go 200 miles an hour in that highway. You can pass the policeman and he can clock you at 200 miles an hour. Guess what? Does he have the right to pull you over? No, 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 no. Well, no, did you break? So does he can't pull you over? So because he can't pull you over, he can't condemn you under the law, and he can't show you grace either, because what law have you broken? Mm -hmm. exactly. So if you're going to tell me that the law of God is done away with, then what there is need of grace? Exactly. No need. There's no need of grace? There's no need of forgiveness of sin? What law is there? No mercy. You can live lawlessly. You can live lawlessly with no rules. The only way the police can show you grace is if you broke a law of the highway. Same thing with the law of God. You got the law of God, and if you break it, God, the law condemns us under the law, because the law says, um, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, the consequence of the penalty of sin is death, but guess what? The grace of God is eternal life with Jesus Christ our Lord. That means that if we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, then God gives us His grace and the power to turn away from sin, and He takes that death penalty upon Himself, which He took at the cross. So the law of God is important. Now, how does that all tie up to the Antichrist? Come with me to 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter uh, two. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and we're going to read verse three through four. And then we're going to jump down to verse 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. And then we're going to jump down to verse 8. Paul again says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. That word falling away first, if I remember right in the Greek, means apostasia, which means apostasy. Paul says that, before that day comes, there's going to be a great apostasy, a falling away. And he says, and, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Sin is transgression of the law, or lawlessness. So that man who transgresseth God's law is going to be revealed. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The papacy, we know the papacy fits this. There's numerous quotes of the Pope claiming to be God on earth. And if you actually look at the Pope's throne, the Bible says that God in his throne, where God dwells, he dwells between two cherubims. I believe that's Ezekiel. Uh, he, God dwells between two cherubims. When you look at the Pope's throne, it's a big white throne, and there's two cherubims by each side. Yeah. Sitting in the throne of God as God, claiming yourself to be God. The reformers, the Protestant reformers, they look at this verse, and they know exactly, 
this is who he's talking about. And when you look at when the papacy was established, it was established after there was a great apostasy. Because remember Constantine? Remember the story of Constantine? And how Constantine supposedly converted to, from paganism to Christianity, but in reality all he did was recolored, reshaped, and he brought in all these pagan idols and renamed them after Christian names. He brought in all the pagan holidays and renamed them after Christian holidays, and he, he blended Christianity and paganism. And that's when Catholicism began to kind of take off after that. And the real Christians who kept to the Bible, they were, they began to be persecuted. Jump down to verse 8. Jump down to verse 8. It says, and, when, and, and, then that, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with all the brightness of his coming. You know, he says, and then that wicked shall be revealed. When you look up the word that wicked, that wicked, it means... It has a very interesting meaning. The word that wicked in the Greek means lawless or transgressor. Or as verse 3 puts it, the man of sin be revealed. So now that wicked one, that antichrist, and, and, and who is the power behind the earthly antichrist? Satan. He's the real antichrist. Revelation makes that clear that the dragon gave the beast his power and his seat and his great authority. And who's the dragon? The dragon is the devil, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So you have the earthly antichrist being given power by the by the, spirit, by the power of Satan, the, 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 the spiritual antichrist. It's, it's a war, it's a great controversy. So when we hear this sugar-coated gospel, this, this, this sugar-coated message that we don't need repentance from sin. Everything's okay. You're under grace. You need to keep God's law. You're promoting lawlessness. And who's the lawless one? It's the man of sin. And that's the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is opposite of Christ. It's an, it's an opposition of Christ. And Christ came to save us from our sins, which means that the Antichrist sugar-coated message is a message that keeps us in sin. Now back to the Facebook meme, as I said earlier. That really got my mind uh, agitated in this chain of thought. It was, a, it was a, a, a man, and he was talking to his pastor. And he said, Pastor, how will you be able to identify the Antichrist, or a.k.a. the lawless one, how will you be able to identify the lawless one if you preached that the law is done away with and there is no law? Wow, good point. How are you going to identify the Antichrist if you're preaching an Antichrist message? Exactly. And that is how millions and many Christians are going to end up following the Antichrist when the time comes. Because we have been drawn to this sugar-coated alternative gospel Paul says, I believe in, in, I think it's Galatians, he says, I marvel that you, are, that you are so soon removed into another gospel and have been taught another Jesus. Paul's like, I didn't teach you that gospel. I didn't preach to you that Jesus. This is a sugar-coated gospel message that we're seeing. If there is no law, then there, then there is no sin. How could grace exist if there is no law? But we're being taught that we're under grace. We don't need to keep God's law. It's, it's, it doesn't go together. It's hypocritical when you, when you look at it. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Come with me to Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes. Uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 13. I'm sure we've read this one many times before. 
write in your notes. Uh, you can write in your notes. You can connect this one with James chapter 2 as we read earlier uh, and 1 John 3, 4. But you could also write uh, Isaiah 30, verse 9 through 11. And uh, we're not going to go to Isaiah 30, but we're going we're to mention it. We're going to briefly talk about it. Isaiah 30, what? Isaiah 30, 9 through 11. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is a very similar message to the gospel message, the true gospel message that uh, uh, Revelation, uh, Revelation 14 talks about. And I saw, and I saw in heaven uh, uh, three angels having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that to preach unto the men that dwell in the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice. The first thing it talks about is fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him. How do we worship God? We worship God on His holy day, yeah. according to the commandment. In the fear of God, we keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is, this is what we must do if we want to be saved. We love God. God saved us from sin. So now how do we live a godly life, a righteous life in Christ? We follow His Word. We follow Christ's precepts. And Christ says to keep my commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Come with me to, uh, to Psalms chapter 119. Psalms chapter 119. And we'll read verse 151. Yeah, Psalms 119, verse 151. It says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are what? Truth. truth. God's commandments are truth. Why? Because uh, Deuteronomy... Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, says, God is a God of truth, just and right is He. God doesn't lie. In fact, the Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. God is a God of truth, so all of God's ways are truth, so His commandments have to be truth. Now, what does it say about Satan? Jesus says he is a liar and the father of it. So, if God's commandments are truth, then any <coughs> gospel that teaches us that we don't need to keep God's commandments because they're done away with, then that, guess what? That's not truth. That's a false gospel. It's a false message. It's a message that's going to be very popular in the end times. Jump with me to 2 Timothy. Jump with me to, come, come with me to 2 Timothy. And Isaiah 30, in Isaiah 30, we're not going to go there, but in Isaiah 30, verse 9 through 11, and I told you to mark, to mark it, you can also, Isaiah 30, I love to link Isaiah 30 with here, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 through 3, because what's going on in Isaiah, in Isaiah 30 is very interesting. God says to Isaiah, to tell to the people of Israel, he tells Isaiah, he says, uh, uh, this is a rebellious people, a people who will not listen and reject the law of God. So if you reject God's law, that means you're what? You're in lies, you're in sin. Because sin is breaking God's law. So if you reject God's law, you're in sin. And Isaiah is t and God is telling Isaiah, this is a rebellious people who, who reject God's law, who say unto the seers, see not. And unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, prophesy unto us smooth things. And they actually tell the prophets, prophesy deceits. Prophesy lies. They openly say, prophesy deceits. The next verse, verse 11, I believe, it says, they even go a step further. They say, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from walking before us. That's what happens when they have accepted this false gospel that we don't need to keep the law of God. We can live life however we want. Guess what? We still got the sanctuary because it's in Jerusalem and they lived in Jerusalem. We still got the sanctuary. We still, we still sacrifice the lambs. God says your sacrifices are of none effect because you've lost the point of what the sacrifice is. 
Why? Because you're falling into a false message, a new system of things in the church. They started changing the things in the sanctuary. They started bringing in idol worship in the sanctuary. They started changing the, the teachings of the sanctuary. They started bringing graven images in the sanctuary. They started changing the music of the sanctuary. They started changing everything. Don't we start seeing this yeah. type of change oh, in church yeah. today? Change in worship songs? Yeah. Change in worship songs? Everything is bringing into a new order of things that is lowering the standards of church and is bringing about a new teaching. Second Timothy. Timothy. Hmm? Second Timothy 1? Yeah, Second Timothy 4, verse, um, verse 3 through 4. And it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It's talking about the end times. They're not going to endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, meaning teachers who are going to tickle their ears to tell the people exactly what they want to hear. In Israel, they said, prophesy unto us lies and deceits. Guess what? The teachers in the end times, they're going to do exactly that. Why? Because the people want that says in verse 4, And they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. fables. You want to know how I was talking with a preacher a couple days ago, actually yesterday. You want to know how they will reach the point of accepting fables and rejecting truth? You know how King Saul got to reach the point where God did not speak to him anymore? He says, God doesn't talk to me through vision, through prophets, through pure. God doesn't talk to me. So I had no choice but to go to this witch of anger. You know why Saul was in the, in, in, the, in the predicament that he was in? Because he cut off every single channel of truth that God could use to talk to him. He killed the priest. Yes. He slaughtered all the priests. Yes. Didn't have mercy on them. He said, kill every one of them. The priests were God's instruments to teach His word to the people. So now no priests. You're not going to get no word of God. He persecuted David, the God's anointed. So now you can't receive the message through David. He persecuted, even, he even tried to kill his son, Jonathan. And Jonathan was a man who feared God. Literally, he slaughtered and cut away every single channel that God uses to talk to him. So by default, he aligned himself, he rejected God's truth, and he aligned himself to fables. And that's what's going to happen when Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, and this gospel is going to go throughout the whole world for a witness, that's very key, a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Because everybody's going to have an opportunity to hear God's truth, and then it's going to be a battle of the minds. What am I going to do? Am I going to accept the law of God? A law that was told to me was done away with? Now I have to go and face my sins and go and confess before God? Or am I going to take the easy route and just follow the Antichrist? And accept the mark of the beast? Because that's what it is. The mark of the beast is from the Antichrist. It's a false system of worship. Come with me to, let's start closing this up. Let's go to 1 John. Let's go back to 1 John. First John chapter 5. Let's go to 1 John 5. And let's read verse 2 through 3. 1 John 5, verse 2 through 3 says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So is God's commandments hard to keep? Yeah. It's hard to keep if you're on the side of Satan, if you're on the side of the devil, and it's very hard to keep because now you're fighting the flesh, the lust of the flesh. But guess what? When we submit ourselves to God, God says all things are possible. Mm -hmm. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Yes. Amen. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his own
only begotten Son, that whosoever there is, whosoever believeth on Him, which means if you entrust your spiritual well-being to Christ, if you whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Let's jump over, stay with me in 1 John. Let's go to John 3. Come with me to John 3. 1 John or John? 1 John, 1 John. Same book, same book. Same book, two chapters. Verse 24. And we'll close right here. John 3, verse 24 says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. So when, when we keep God's commandments, the Bible says we dwell with Christ, and Christ dwells in us Amen. by keeping God's commandments. You can tie this with um, with Revelation 14, 12. It says, here are the patience of the saints. Here are they, God says, that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the faith or the truth of Christ. The commandments of God are truth, we read earlier. Amen? Amen. So how will many be deceived and follow the Antichrist? Because they believe in a system, in a gospel, that is opposite of Christ. But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded our hearts. But guess what? Jesus says there is nothing hid that will not be revealed. <laughs> nothing covered that shall not be uncovered. So if the gospel is hid right now by the devil, the real antichrist, then guess what? Jesus says, I'm going to uncover the gospel. The gospel is going to go throughout the whole world for witness into the nations, and then the end shall come. It's going to go, everyone's going to have an opportunity to make a decision on whose side they're going to be on. And the only way, the only way that you and I are going to be on the right side is if we study our Bibles. If we study the Word of God and we are grounded in the Bible and pray daily and ask God's help, that's the only way that God's grace is going to be. Amen.